So when I was a kid, growing up, I played basketball out in my driveway in the rain. When our speaker was a kid, he went to the cabinet and pulled out spices, mixed them together, repackaged them, and sold them back to his mom. When I was in high school, I played guitar at chapel and I worked at summer camp. When our speaker was in high school, he manufactured his own skim boards and sold them to his friends. When I was in college, I spent my time being a resident advisor. Woo woo, any resident advisors in the house? Yeah, all right. And working on my communication courses projects. When our speaker was in college, he was starting a nonprofit organization called Patton Towers. When I was in grad school, I spent my days praying for mercy over my Greek homework. And our speaker started CrossFit Barian, which ended up becoming LifeRx on the other side of town. And now, of course, you know I work here, and our speaker today uh, owns and runs his own company called Fruition Labs. But the main thing that you need to know about our speaker today is that he is incredibly genuine, incredibly warm. He cares deeply, and what he wants you to know is what it means to be created in God's image and what it means to create as God's image bearer. So I want you guys to give a warm welcome to our speaker for today, Jeff Tatarchuk, who will be coming up after the video. My dad says entrepreneurs are responsible for everything around me, from the technology I use to the clothes I wear and the food I eat. He says I should be grateful for the entrepreneurs that have come before me because starting something from nothing is extremely difficult. Many do it against all odds. He says entrepreneurs are the courageous ones, the ones that never give up, never give in, never, never, never. Starting something new takes heart. It takes believing without seeing. My dad says that's faith. He says every organization you see with 10 people, or a hundred or a thousand, started with just one. One amazing idea, one brave soul, one perfect partnership, one humble beginning, one heroic mission. And because God inspired the one, the one inspired millions. My dad's an entrepreneur, and someday I'm gonna be an entrepreneur too. And so I pray. Dear Lord, the battles I go through life, I ask for a chance that's fair, a chance to equal my stride, a chance to do or dare. If I should win, let it be by the code, with faith and honor held high. If I should lose, let me stand by the road and cheer as the winners go by. Day by day, get better and better, till I can't be beat, won't be beat. Day by day, get better and better, till I can't be beat, won't be beat. Amen. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Awesome. Uh, thank you, DK. Man, that was the best intro I have ever received in my entire life. I almost didn't want to come up here after that because he just nailed my life so perfect. <laughs> like you know me or something. Um, thank you, DK, the Keels for the hospitality, Chaplain Jose for inviting me, and Andrews. You know, when you leave Andrews, you never expect to come back. At least we didn't. We hope not to. But it's so good to be back here. Um, in, real, in, in reality, it's, it's, it's the people here that makes the place. And it's truly a special place. Berrien Springs holds a uh, special place in our heart. And uh, it's good to be here. I'm here with my beautiful wife. Like wife, raise your hand. Do Yeah, there you go. She's here. And um, yeah, it's, it's been good. We spent five years here from 2012 until 2017. And so it uh, definitely has a strong place in our heart. But uh, we definitely like living in Southern California right now. Yes. Amen. <laughs> How many of you from Southern California? Okay. No, no, no dreams of like warm 70 degree weather in, in the wintertime? The beaches that you can actually use year round? Yeah. 
Anyway, um, I'm an entrepreneur. I didn't always know I was an entrepreneur. As a matter of fact, when I was growing up uh, in school, I, I wasn't really the type of person that fit in in the classroom. I, I was diagnosed with ADHD, ADD, dyslexia, delinquency, all these different things because my teachers and parents couldn't figure out what to do with me. They couldn't put me in this box. And so I received all of these labels and these labels made me feel like, well, I just don't fit in to society. I didn't know that I was an entrepreneur. I was also born and raised in San Bernardino, California. How many of you know what I'm talking about when I say San Bernardino, California? Yeah. For those of you that don't know, it's right next door to Loma Linda, California. You got Loma Linda on one side, then the freeway divides it, and then you have San Bernardino on the other. San Bernardino was the second bankrupt city in the United States, just behind Detroit. It has more gangs per capita than anywhere else in the United States. Uh, the homelessness is huge, it's, it's, it, but it's where I call home. It's where I was born. My parents still live in the same two-bedroom, one-bath house to this day, 40 years later where I was born. But I went to a school on the other side of the tracks, Loma Linda Academy. That's where the doctor's kids hung out. And of course, when you're growing up and you're younger, you, you want to figure out a way to fit in with the doctor's kids. And you want to wear the name brand clothes. You want to have the video games and the things that they could afford that I couldn't afford. And so what did I do? I decided I would figure out a way to make my own money in order to be able to afford these things. And uh, the first thing I did is I, I, I spray painted a, a, a plywood, a uh, piece of plywood, put it on the edge of my street, and I started a car wash on a street that probably only had 10 cars pass by a day. But I said, as long as we wash one car a day for $5 a car wash, it'll be enough money for me to keep up with my friends. Then I get to middle school, and I'm trying to figure out a way to keep up with them as well, get the name brand clothes. And I said, well, I can't afford the name brand clothes that you're wearing. I'm just going to go out and create my own clothes. And so I went to Walmart, got the iron-on little sheets, had somebody design something cool that I thought was cool. And um, yeah, we did the iron-on thing. It actually was pretty awesome. Sold it to our friends. We had this thing called Choice Skate Company that was uh, pretty awesome. And then, as uh, Donnie mentioned earlier, I started this spice thing where I would take my mom's spices out of her cupboard and redistribute them and then sell them back to her and the rest of my family. <laughs> right? You got to be resourceful with the things that you can find at your disposal. You know, as I was sharing, I, I had a chance to be here all week and I had some time to spend some time in the dorms and the classrooms. And the first question that everybody asks me as I'm sharing my story is, where did you get your money? I didn't have any money. I had to find creative ways of making money. Beyond that, um, when I went to Monterey Bay Academy, anybody from MBA in the building, MBA? No, man, you missed out. Um, we, it was right on the beach and I was able to produce skim boards. You know, I was also, again, even through high school, wasn't somebody who felt like I really fit into the traditional school sense. I loved my friends, I loved people, but school just didn't seem to make any sense to me. And so I remember being in woodworking class and the professor said, you can make whatever you want to make. And I loved surfing and skimboarding at the time. I had a surfboard, but I didn't have a skimboard. And if you had these fiberglass skimboards, they usually cost you about two to three hundred dollars, like the good ones. And so I decided I'm going to make a skimboard. So I took a piece of plywood, resin that thing, cut it out, and made these skimboards. Well, these skimboards ended up being better, faster, easier to control than the two or three hundred dollars skimboards. And so I said, man, I'm onto something. I uh, was able to turn that into something I could sell to my friends. But one of the things I wish, looking back now, that somebody would have come to me and said, Jeff, you can turn these ideas that you are creating and things that you are making money off of into a sustainable business. Well, unfortunately, within Adventism, we don't really have a strong support system for entrepreneurs. We have a very strong support system for pastors, for teachers, for doctors and for healthcare administrators, but it seems like the rest of the people outside of that bubble tend to fall through the cracks. And so when my mom said, hey, Jeff, you need to go to college, 
will you please just give me one semester? I was like, man, I don't even want to do this school thing. I was planning on joining the surf circuit as a photographer and kind of figuring it out along the way. I didn't think I'd make it through school. I never thought I'd make it through high school. I never thought I'd make it through junior high. And especially, I didn't think I'd make it through college. So I went. I went to Southern Adventist University for my undergrad. I went for one semester. I said, OK, I'll give my mom a try. And I'll take theology. I figured theology is the easy way out. It, I liked <laughs> little was Little did I know, I didn't know about Greek and Hebrew at the time. But um, yeah, so it, it was something that I took and I was um, yeah, excited about, not necessarily the school, but excited about the friends and people that I met along the way. Um, while I was there, I started a nonprofit ministering to some people in downtown Chattanooga. And I also met my wife there. Yeah, yeah. They say Adventist education is the most expensive dating service on the planet. It worked for me. It worked for me. Um, yeah, hopefully it works for you too. If not, you're gonna have a while to pay it off. Went from that to being an evangelist. When I left Southern, I had 10 calls to different conferences, but I still, even though I liked the Bible, I loved speaking and preaching, I just didn't feel like I fit within the confines or the box of traditional ministry or pastoring. And so I turned down all of those calls, waiting for something else that I felt like God, you have something else in store for me. I'm going to wait and see what that is. So I worked in downtown Chattanooga for a while and got picked up as an evangelist. I worked as an evangelist in Southeastern California Conference. And I loved it. It fit my personality. I loved working for churches for four or five months at a time, preaching my head off for a month, baptizing people, seeing the light bulb go off in people's minds. And it was exciting to me. But I realized time and time again that the current model of evangelism that we were using wasn't a sustainable model. I would preach, baptize people, and I would be afraid to call those people back two or three weeks later because most likely they weren't there. And that's when I was introduced to, um, I, I started working at Loma Linda University Church as a, an associate pastor for the young adult ministry there. And I saw that they launched a thrift store. And as they launched this thrift store, the thrift store, if you've been to Loma Linda, was right up against the 10 freeway. Loma Linda on this side, the thrift store was on this side, and San Bernardino was right on the other. And one of the cool things that I saw about this thrift store was that 150 people a day were coming from San Bernardino through this business. And I said, man, when I'm preaching, doing my evangelistic meetings, it's pulling teeth to get five people to show up. But these guys are just opening up their doors, and people are coming through, and it's profitable. They were, making, they were doing $15,000 a month, and they had a, a surplus of money by the end of the year. And this was run by a ministry. And so I said, I get it. Entrepreneurship for me was a sustainable way of reaching the community, making an impact, and building relationships with people around you. So at that point, I realized I am an entrepreneur. I'm built for this. I've started things. I've created things. And things continued to develop and evolve. Went from that to to seeing like, man, I've, I, as an evangelist, I want to see as many people, everyone, come into the kingdom and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's my goal. And that's why I was so frustrated when only 10 people would show up to the church uh, when I was preaching. And I said, why can't we fill our stadiums with people preaching the gospel? And well, one of the reasons why is you need money to fill a stadium and attract and do the marketing to fill the stadium. And so I said, okay, well, I'm going to start creating some other things that will uh, create a sustainable economy in order for me to do this thing. So we started doing mud runs. Anybody ever done a Spartan race? Spartan race, Spartan race, some of you? Those are like those crazy mud run adventure races. You might have seen them. We were doing that before Spartan was doing it um, as a way of raising money. And so we're doing all these sort of things over and over again. Um, trying to find ways to make money. All of these things were kind of a means to an end. I wanted to do something big, something better, um, but it didn't seem like things were fitting. I uh, went from that to doing this thing called, uh, created a, a Bible study series called Truthlink Bible Study Guides. Have you ever used those Bible study guides? Yeah, we, we created those and then sold them to um, Light Bears, and Light Bears is using those to this day. I went from that to, okay, the conference that I was working with in Southeastern said, it's time for you to go to seminary. And guess what my heart did? Cried. Cried. Sunk. <laughs> Not that I have anything against the seminary. It's just it, the thing wasn't for me. And so I, I went, but I decided this is what I was going to do. Because I liked thrift stores and I saw the impact that the thrift store had in my local town, I said, 
huh, neighbor to neighbor is only open two days a week. I'm going to open up a thrift store that's open five days a week. Um, because the closest thrift store, or Goodwill, or Salvation Army was 10 miles in either direction, I'm going to see what happens. And so we opened up the goods uh, about six years ago. And uh, within a year of that, while I was in school, I um, yeah, went from that to my business partner, who was working with me at the time, had a brain aneurysm. And so we weren't able to continue running this business. Now, I'm in seminary. I'm known as this guy who has started a business while I was in school and doing all these other things. And I had felt like I was a failure. I felt like I had failed because we had closed for an entire summer and went from closing to gaining a lot of weight, you know, because we only have Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, McDonald's, and Baguette. <laughs> and I had put on a lot of weight until one of my seminary buddies introduced me to this thing called the burpee. You've heard of the burpee before? It's how the fitness community has turned falling down and getting back up into a fitness regiment. And so we quickly decided, well, we can turn our thrift store into a CrossFit gym just because we needed a place to work out in the, somewhere warm to work out. I just wanted to be able to pay off my lease, ride out the expenses until I was done with seminary, and then my wife and I would move back to uh, Southern California when I was done. Well, we were able to meet our expenses the very first day we opened and break even by the end of the month. And I was like, shoot, didn't expect this. We're on to something here. Um, the, the cool thing about it was my wife showed up the very first day. She said, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do Pilates. And if any of you have ever done CrossFit before, they are polar opposites of fitness regiments. And so she said she was going to do both and uh, ended up coming out to CrossFit our very first day and never left. And so she started growing, became a coach, became the director of the gym, started running the gym, and it became this beautiful thing that we were able to go from that to partnering up with someone in the community, buying the building, triple our size, and it's Life RX is what it is today. Not what I expected, but amazing nonetheless. Now, what do I do? We decided last uh, summer that we were going to sell our portion of the business and move back to Southern California. And one of the things along the way that I get excited about is seeing people be able to take their ideas and make them a sustainable reality. I realized that I didn't fit in the traditional box of education. I didn't fit in the traditional career set. I almost feel like many times that I'm unemployable. Where, where do I fit? What do I do? How do I survive? How do I put food on, my tab on the table to feed my family? Until I discovered this word called ikigai. Any of you ever heard of this word, ikigai? Ikigai comes from Okinawa, Japan. There was a study that was done by National Geographic on the blue zones. And the blue zones are the areas in the world that have the highest concentration of people that live over 100 years old. One happens to be Loma Linda, that's where I'm from. Hopefully that still works out. The second was Sardinia, Italy, and the third is Okinawa, Japan. And as Dan Buettner was doing his research in Okinawa, Japan, he realized this word kept coming up over and over again, ikigai, ikigai. And they attributed their ikigai to why they live up to 100 years old. And so as he started digging in deeper into this word, he found out that the word ikigai means your reason for waking up in the morning. They feel like they had a sense and a reason for waking up in the morning. And it could be something as simple as going out into the rice fields. They feel like they had a purpose, a reason for waking up in the morning. Um, do you feel like you have a reason for waking up in the morning? Why do you wake up in the morning? And so as I was digging in a little bit deeper into this concept of ikigai and kind of identifying what it was about my life, um, as the researchers have come together, they say the ikigai are these things. Put up the thing on the screen. It's being able to take how to identify your strengths, figure out what your passions are, how you're gonna make an impact in the world, and ultimately get paid to do it. So pursuing your passion, finding your mission, figuring out your profession, and your vocation, or your calling. And at the center of all of those things is your ikigai. And when you find that, it's kind of this secret sauce to longevity. It's ultimately your purpose in life. And so I felt like, man, I didn't feel like I fit in the traditional scheme of education, career, jobs, and all those other things, but I do feel like I can understand what my ikigai is because I understand what my strengths are. 
I understand that I am somebody who, uh, who is an ideator. I come up with ideas all the time and implement them. I am an entrepreneur. Now, I think it's, it's awesome. There's this text. i got to read it to you. It's in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 17. It says, this is Paul talking to the church. He says, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him or her to which God has called him, this is my rule in all of the churches. I love this because he says, only let each person lead the, lo- lead the life that the Lord has assigned to you. To you. Not what your teacher assigns you, not what your parents assign you, not what anybody else assigns you, but lead the life that the Lord has assigned to you. Do you know what that life is for you? Have you discovered what that life is yet? Go to the next text. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12, it says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a what? Is a tree of life. And to me, this is the essence of what that ikigai actually is. It's discovering what the desire that God has put on your heart is for you, your purpose. And once you discover that, it is a tree of life. And as a matter of fact, it is a secret to your long life. Longevity. And so it's my challenge to you this morning. If you don't have your reason for waking up in the morning, find it. Ask God for it. Figure out what your strengths are. There's tools out there that can be used to identify your strengths. One of them is the Gallup Strengths Finder test. Figure out what your top five strengths are, double down on those things. And then figure out what your passions are. Now, your passions are something, a lot of people say, like, pursue your passions, right? Pursue your passions. Well, passion is a word that's associated with the passion of the Christ, the process that Jesus went through to get to the cross. Passion has a whole deeper association than we make it out today. It's not just this cotton candy dream that we're pursuing, but it's actually something that you are willing to, it's something you love so much that you're willing to suffer through anything to make it a reality. That's what your passion is. What do you love so much that you are willing to go through anything, the scrutiny of your friends, family, what gets, what gets you excited, what gets you moving in the morning? This is your passion and pursue that. And then what will make an impact in the world and ultimately how will you get paid to do it? And that's the idea of the entrepreneur. Now the question is what is entrepreneurship. What is entrepreneurship? My definition after a long stint of starting different things in my life is this. Go to the screen. Well, this is the traditional idea of what entrepreneurship is. You've seen with Facebook and Apple and Shark Tank, all of these things, entrepreneurship has become in vogue. But what is entrepreneurship? Keep going, keep going. One more. An entrepreneur is someone who has an idea and is able to make that idea a what? Sustainable reality. Now, I used to get really offended when people would say, Jeff, you're an ideas guy, right? Because what does that naturally entail? That I do stuff and just think of doing things without actually implementing those things. But in reality, an entrepreneur is somebody who's able to take an idea and make it a sustainable reality. Reality. Somebody who's able to identify a problem, but instead of just complaining about that problem, they come up with a solution to that problem. An entrepreneur is somebody who has a vision of not what things are currently, but as the things that can be in the world. God was also an entrepreneur. God he got together with, with the Godhead and said, let us create the, the world. This is in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Those things didn't exist before. They started out as an idea in his mind. And then it goes on to say in verse 2, it says that the world was without form and void. God identified a situation. He identified a problem and brought order out of chaos. That's what an entrepreneur does. Keep going. And then he said, I got another idea. After he spoke everything else into existence, he said, let us make man in our image. I love this because he came down to this earth, pulled together the resources that he already spoken into existence, fashioned mankind into his image, and breathed his life into this thing. Now, it's interesting. 
A lot of times we, we think that, um, you know, we say, well, we were created in the image of God. And what does that typically mean for people? We were made in his image of love, right? Like we say that a lot. But I think it's very interesting here that I believe that we were all created in his image to be creators. We were all created to create. For instance, I could probably, if I had the skills, I could probably make a table like this. I don't have the skills, but if I did and had the resources available to make it a reality, I could take this as a thought in my brain and make this table, fashion it with this, build the steel out and do whatever to make this thing a reality. However, I can't make this table with the ability to go out and make more tables. When God created us, he created us with the ability to not only create things, but he created us with the ability to create and to continue to create. And I think it's important for each and every one of us to realize the creative power that God has given to each and every one of you. To be able to take immaterial thoughts and turn those immaterial thoughts into material realities. No matter what it is, whether it's a song, a book, a building, a business, no matter what it is, you have the ability to turn something in your mind and make it a reality. I think that's amazing. And to me, that's what I get excited about when I think of entrepreneurship. I think of unlimited possibilities, limited only by your imagination. And I believe that all of us have the capacity to do this. And so this is what's got me really excited today, is the ability to encourage entrepreneurs to go out there, take risks, to dream, to build, to create, to network, and to ultimately go out and change the world. And I think each and every one of us has that capacity to do that, to take immaterial thoughts and make them material realities in the world. And so this is really exciting for me. And I'm currently at a place today where we started this thing called Fruition Lab. Fruition Lab was started under the auspices of being able to help people take an idea to market and then from market to wherever they need to be in the world by pulling out people from all walks of life, all stages of entrepreneurship to a place where we can be successful, because, yeah, it's really cool to see what entrepreneurs can do today. And I want to ask a question. How many of you in this room feel like you're an entrepreneur? Like you want to start a business one day. You have an idea that you want to make a reality. Let me see your hands. Awesome. Well, we have really cool um, an opportunity coming up, and I want to invite Jose up, and if we can have a, yeah. So, Jeff, uh, real quick. There's something about some kind of scholarship. Yeah. Tell me about that. What, what, can, what can we do to help these guys take the next step? So one of the biggest questions that I mentioned that everybody was asking was, um, I have a business idea, but I don't have the money to do it. What do I do? Well, Fruition, we, thankfully, we're given a donation through a scholarship to, we're going to start a competition that's going to be like an American Idol slash Shark Tank. And each university, we're starting with six universities this year, and Andrews is one of those universities where students from this college will be able to submit their idea, and the best idea will get $2,500 uh, seed funding towards their idea. And then as a result of that, you'll be able to go to our larger Fruition Lab pitch competition and pitch before some of the biggest um, investors, venture capitalists within our church. Now, I, uh, what gets me really excited, so listen, if you want some money to, to get your idea to go, uh, submit your pitch. Let's put that up on the screen so where you can submit your pitch. We're going to be uh, sharing more details specifically in the next couple of weeks on how you can do this. Um, when you say entrepreneurs, uh, venture capitalists, Jeff, what has amazed me is some of the Adventists that show up to this room yeah. and probably people that we don't even associate as being Adventist. How many of you have heard of life-proof cases for iPhone? It's usually next Tell to us, OtterBox. So, it's next to OtterBox. Tell us about life-proof. So it's, it's the expensive iPhone case. It's the one that's 120 bucks. You go to the Best Buy. Um, life-proof iPhone case was started by this guy who was an Adventist out in San Diego, California, and was able to sell it to OtterBox for nine figures. Nine figures. That puts it over $100 million. Um, not only that, we have, if you can put up a picture, of, uh, there's a big collage of a lot of the entrepreneurs that we have in our, our system. I think you see it's blocked. But in the far right, top right, um, we have Mike Parnell, who's the CEO of Oakley. 
Um, we have this guy who, when he was at Southern, started a software business out of his own dorm room, solving a problem at a local hospital that eventually turned into a software company that he sold eight years later. The guy's my age, 31 years old, that he sold eight years later for nine figures. Crazy. Um, but it's the whole spectrum. It's, it's not just these guys who are selling for multi, multi-million dollars, but it's also people who are starting bakeries, people who are looking to succeed in the industry, um, whether it's music, as an author, all these different areas. Our goal with Fruition is to get you connected with the biggest and best people in our circles who have gone before and done it and give you the resources necessary to make your ideas a reality. So this is awesome. This is not just about getting some funding. This is about networking. This yeah. is about... Uh, uh, someone to uh, mentoring. This is about consulting. Um, this is a huge thing. I saw some of our students there. Uh, one that stood out was uh, Juan Dealey, who we know started this Ubuntu design company, uh, which is taking off. It's an exciting story. Uh, also, Jeffrey Emil, who's based out of Atlanta, uh, moving from a huge photo industry now into a film documentary. So we have graduates here who have engaged Fruition Lab. Mm -hmm. We're seeing their ideas thrive. Jeff, what would, be, what, would, what would be the greatest disappointment for anybody who has this idea and doesn't act on it? What, what are they missing out on? Well, I think good ideas have an inevitable nature. Have you ever had that said where, where man, you see somebody else who did something, you're like, man, I had that idea. And I think one of the greatest, um, the greatest obstacles is not being too afraid to implement an idea because you feel like you don't have the resources to make it happen. And that's what we at Fruition Lab want to give people the resources, the people, the capital necessary to make great ideas a reality. Because I believe we have the next Mark Zuckerberg, we have the next Steve Jobs, we have the next you know, people within Adventism who can solve some of the biggest problems in the world. But um, yeah, and we want to help people make that a reality. And I, and I love what you pointed out today is that when we act on that desire, when we act on that passion, we are actually mobilizing our um, God-given calling, yeah. what's been assigned to us uh, to be able to uh, ch change the world and, and really just have joy in our life because yeah. we're acting on the desire that God has placed in us. I'm gonna put your contact information on the screen. Uh, for anybody who wants to contact Jeff about Fruition Lab or just some ideas, this brother is hooked up, networked, um, mentoring, has a lot of experience and uh, and what I love about Jeff is his idea of entrepreneurship aligns with his passion to meet needs of the world, uh, which also includes eternal needs, man. Yeah. And that he has a love for God that is uh, profound, and you can see it in everything that he does. If you have questions right now and you have time after class, I invite you to come forward. He'll be available uh, to connect with uh, and to talk. And if you want to also talk to Dean Keel because you think he's awesome, we invite you to come forward <laughs> and talk to Dean Keel. He is awesome. If you want tips on how to introduce people, you can do that. And then if you want to meet uh, Jeff's better half, Joyce, my all-time favorite coach, because she was my coach when she was here uh, uh, regarding fitness, I invite you to come forward. And then also, yeah, there's good people up here in the front. Just come just, forward, just to come. Just come. Just to come. Just come. Um, I'm going to say prayer, and then you will be dismissed. Yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, please help us to be stewards of the desires, the passions, and the abilities and opportunities that you've placed before us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen.